Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I am just excited, I am beyond belief, I am going to be interviewing a cult movie actor and just a damn good actor all around um, that is legendary in cult films. His name is Dan Shore. You may remember him. He was Ram in Tron, the classic computer-generated sci-fi movie, and Billy the Kid in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And, of course, he's been in many other great ones, and I'm pretty excited to uh, be talking to him today. Uh, God, the man, he's, he's worked with all the greats and been in some high-quality movies. And I'm going to be interviewing him today and stuff. I'm pretty excited. I also want to find out, you know, more about him just as an actor and, like, what happened in his career and stuff once the acting roles dried up and everything because he's a, a, a really good actor and he's a chameleon, you know, a journeyman actor. And I want to find out everything about him in that regard. So, yeah, here is my interview with Dan Shore. Hello. Hey, Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> How are you? That's great. It's great. It's, it's such an honor because I've loved you and everything I've ever seen you in, and I appreciate you taking the time today, sir. Oh, no problem whatsoever. <laughs> so, uh, see, I got so much here. Um, so, when did you know that you wanted to be an actor? Oh, man. Um, when did I know? Uh, it's, uh, I think I was 15 years old, 14 years old, 14. Right. And my parents sent me to a summer camp, an artsy craftsy summer camp in Connecticut, outside of New York. And um, I, there were no sports there. There were no, there was no baseball team. There was no soccer team. Huh. There was no basketball. All there was were all of a sudden there were all these plays, and in the plays were these stunningly cute girls. <laughs> Wow. I mean, had you been uh, a movie buff and idolizing certain movie stars? Absolutely not. <laughs> I, I, I was athletes. I was a, a little jock. I was a little rotten New York City jock. Yeah. Um, and my heroes were, were athletes. Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Hank Aaron. Baseball players. Right. You know, that was my thing. And uh, basketball players, the Knicks. You know? Yeah. And you're, uh, so you're originally from New York? Mm-hmm. New York City, in Manhattan. So did you stay there to uh, study acting then? No. Well, I did. When, look, I was 14. I went to summer camp. And by the time I was 16, I was going to theater classes in New York at the uh, uh, American Academy of Dramatic Arts and a place called West Side Actors on the Upper West Side, studying method acting there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was at the age of 16. But when I... I drama school in England. Right. Um, I went to Northwestern University and then got a job and then I went off to London to study because to me that was the pinnacle because um, I was from New York. The idea was to get the hell out of here, not to stay here. <laughs> yeah. You know, so for the rest of the world, they want to come here. For me, I wanted to get out, so I did. Yeah. You didn't want to go to L.A. too early either. No, I didn't know anything about L.A. It wasn't in my radar. My radar was the New York theater. To me, the New York theater was the height of everything. Um, that's what I wanted to achieve. That's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, and what happened was I got flown to L.A. You know, after I went to study in London, I, I came back and got flown to L.A. to star in a miniseries. And that's when I got hooked on L.A. That's when I understood and it was also the only way into L.A., so I didn't know that either. I hadn't even considered going, and then all of a sudden I'm there, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is pretty wonderful. 
Yeah, what, what year did you move there? Yeah, I moved. I, I lived there for 25 years. Wow. Um, I'm back in New York now, but I lived in uh, L.A. for 25 years. Yeah. Wow. And uh, how long was it before you got an agent? I had an agent in a day. No, the, the thing was, is that's the thing. Here's, this is what I recommend. I talk to a lot of people about this. And don't go to L.A. without a gig. Mm-hmm. Unless you're a god. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's the, it's the reality, unless you're a god. And then you're going to show up there even without a gig, and there's going to be a thousand gods. You know, I just remember going to auditions in L.A., and I'd be in a room with 50 people that were better looking than any human beings that ever existed. And they were all getting a big chance, but there were 50 of them. You know what I mean? And yeah. You know, I... It, it just it is you have to come in with something, and the fact that I came in with a gig got me you know a choice of agents overnight. Um, you know if you go in without it, there is absolutely no possibility, none whatsoever, none. Yeah. I mean the people that are working now worked in New York, or they worked in London, or they worked in Chicago, or they worked in Toronto, or they worked in Australia, or they were rappers, or they were athletes, or they were the most beautiful people that ever lived. Came out of modeling. But they came out of something. You don't just walk into L.A. and things happen for you. It's an almost impossibility. They don't have people in coffee shops being discovered anymore. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Or in my field, my field stand-up comedy, you know, it's really yeah. difficult. Yeah. No, it's either in, in New York they come here to try to find people. In L.A. you have to be found already. Yeah. That's my experience. I could be wrong, but I like I hope I'm wrong. Because in some cases I am wrong, but that's how it worked for me, and that's how it worked for pretty much everybody I know who was successful. Wow, yeah, yeah. it's it's subjective, you know. It it's all luck. <laughs> it's not all luck. No, it's when your luck comes in, be ready for it. You know, it's not all luck. People are really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, when you say look at people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you go, how did this fucker make it? Well, the <laughs> fact is that he's brilliant. Do you know what I mean? He is a brilliant weightlifter and competitor and athlete who was able to take, translate that competitive spirit into, uh, into performance and then to take that competitive spirit into politics. I mean, Jesus, the guy's brilliant, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's not anybody can make it unless you look at the Kardashians. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> They're just famous for being famous. <laughs> famous for having, well, actually, they... Yep. <laughs> That's it. You know, they just made an internet sensation by screwing, and that was remarkable that they were able to take that power and turn it into something. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but they turned it into something. Yep. So you started acting professionally at a young age. You did a couple TV stuff, but your first movie was Wise Blood, and you got to work with the legendary John Huston. How did you get that role, and what was it like? agent at the time, Susan Smith, who was one of the great agents in Hollywood, um, she had a relationship with Ben Fitzgerald, with the Fitzgeralds, who were the writers of Wise Blood. Yeah. And somehow I got an audition to play Enoch Emery. Um, and I remember going to the Chateau Marmont to see John Huston in his hotel suite. I mean, I, I love this whole Me Too movement where you don't go to the director's suite. Well, I went to the director's suite, and yeah. thank God I did. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> it was the old school of auditioning, which is uh, uh, coffee or booze on the table, a long period of discussion, mm -hmm. then doing the scene. Right. Uh, and it wasn't like a cattle car. It was like for some reason, I had already started in Suds Lonica in uh, L.A. in a miniseries, and it was a big discovery. Thing. They found the kid from New York and all of this stuff. Yeah. Uh,
mm-hmm. and as a southerner and as an inbreed, as a complete lunatic. And he was so smitten um, that he cast me on the spot. Wow. Just like that. You, just like that. There was no, uh, and it, it's a funny thing because I rarely do that anymore. Um, to go in that committed, to be that outrageously committed. Because right now you go in as yourself, do the part to show them that you can act, mm-hmm. um, and then show that you're not, you don't have a finished product. But I had a finished product. Yeah. I had done the work. I was, I was uh, out of bounds. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would have gotten it otherwise. Obviously, I got it on the spot. It's right there. It says, you're hired. Let's go. Yeah. And uh, it, it changed everything. Changed my, it was, to me, it was winning the World Series. Yeah. That was like one of the first movies New Line Cinema made. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's hard to think about it now, but yeah, wow. Stuff. Did, uh, did John Houston tell any great stories about Humphrey Bogart or any of the legends he worked with? No, not with me. And that's because I didn't play in Houston's uh, weekly poker games. They had <laughs> poker games every Friday night. But they were for hundreds of dollars. I was making six hundred dollars a week, and they were betting losing seven hundred dollars a night. <laughs> so um, I, I remember uh, the the editor would come in, Roberto would come in on Mondays and go, "I'm no money." Because <laughs> <laughs> Houston would take him for his entire salary every week, mm-hmm. and uh, and no mercy. I mean, it's poker. It's hardcore. So I never sat in on the poker games. I know that Harry Dean Stan would go just to hear the stories. Mm-hmm. You know, and he had money to blow. Um, I think Ned Beatty went in on him, but I wouldn't go. I couldn't go. Too bad. I know they'd kill me. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you got to work with a great cast. Uh, those those mentioned actors, also Brad Dourif, who was coming out of um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He's such an intense actor, that guy. Yeah, he's one of my heroes. I love. You know, it's one of those things. Remember when you asked me, did I love movies? Yeah. I, I did, and one of my heroes was Brad Dourif, because, of course, I was that young ingenue, and there he was as Billy Bibbit, one of the great characters of all time, for teenage angst, right. for the teenage uh, horror of, of uh, yeah, it's literally teen angst, that is the, the great teen angst character. And then I worked with him when I did Studs Lonnie, and I played son Studs Lonnie, and he played my best friend, Danny. And then in Derby and Owen Weisblatt, we became really good friends after that. And I was stayed friends with Brad for years. And he was one of my heroes, still is, actually. Yeah, it's, it's funny, you know, when he uh, was, was up for the Academy Award, he, you know, he lost to George Burns for the Sunshine Boys. And don't get me wrong, I love George Burns, and he was great in that movie. But at the end of the day, he was just George Burns. And yeah. Brad Dourif should have won. Yeah. <laughs> and the Sunshine Boys is one of the great movies of all time. But I'm now a member of the Academy, right? Yeah. And I have for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And usually they're pretty close. You know, if George Burns wins, it's George Burns. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're just doing it to give George Burns an Academy Award, we're good for you. It's George fucking Burns. You know what I mean? He's yeah. Not, literally. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think maybe he, they could have given him the honorary Oscar or something, but you know that that's I've just had a me. Career. Yeah, he yeah, he had an amazing career. Yeah. And then um, you did another movie I really like called Backroads. Wow! Yeah, Sally Field. Yeah. 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 That was Marty Ritt. Right. Now you have to remember that I came out of New York and I came out of Blacklist. I grew up in I went to high school in Greenwich Village in a school called uh, Elizabeth Irwin, which was the upper school of the Little Red Schoolhouse, mm-hmm. which was created as a progressive high school for the parents of blacklisted children. Mm-hmm. So I was in the middle of this kind of liberal upbringing uh, and progressive liberal upbringing in the middle of Manhattan. And I grew up in the blacklist era. My best right. friend's dad was blacklisted. My mom was blacklisted. Wow. Even though she had no success, she was on the list. She she was blacklisted from a minor career. Yeah. But we experienced that, and Marty Rick was one of the people that stood up to uh, to the House of Un-American Activities. And 
you do realize today, in case you hadn't noticed, we haven't forgotten. We, nothing is discussed right now, but every tactic that um, that Donald Trump uses, he was trained by Roy Cohn, mm-hmm. who was the right-hand man to McCarthy, one of the most evil people that ever lived, which is, is Roy Cohn. A amoral, immoral monster. Right. The destroyer of, 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 of the truth. And Trump has learned well. Um, so, I mean, it circles around. But Marty Ritt was one of the great people of his time because he did fight the blacklist. And it was an honor to work with him, even though it was a kind of a lightweight film. But everybody wanted to work with him because it was him. Yeah. So that must have been a huge highlight for you to work with, uh, with Martin Ritt. Yeah, just to be around him, and, I, and 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 Tommy Lee Jones, who is brilliant. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I heard and Shelley Field was delightful. She was delightful. Yeah, and I heard the two of them did not get along. No, they didn't. It's hard to get along with Tommy Lee. Yeah, I worked with him on another film also called Black Moon Rising. Love that movie. Um, and Linda Hamilton didn't like him either. Yeah. <laughs> any niceties. Yeah. He was just a crotchety... He would pull a crotchety fit on the set of Black Moon Rising Mm -hmm. and look at me during the fit and wink. Mm -hmm. He was just trying to avoid listening to the director. Yeah. He was... He knew more than everybody and it was a little bit... um, I don't know. I don't know. I, now, mind you, I worked with him on Black Moon Rising and and um, Back Roads. That wasn't the fugitive. So, and it wasn't <laughs> Miner's daughter. So he might not. He might have known that he wasn't in those movies. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh my God, that's crazy. And, yeah. then, and then you did uh, the very bold horror classic, Strange Behavior. Yeah, was it, that. that was a good experience. In New Zealand, before New Zealand was in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to work with another great cast, Michael Murphy, Louise Fletcher, yeah. Fiona Lewis, Day Young, yeah. uh, Mark yeah. McClure, Scott Brady. Ooh, that's yeah. a great cast. I know, I know. It was a great cast. And not long ago, but I don't know when it was, a year or two ago, they did a screening of that, of Strange Behavior in Brooklyn at one of these cool theaters and they brought Michael Murphy and I out Mm -hmm. and we went out there and did a post show discussion. Yeah. So much fun. Yeah. And the movie was better than I remember it. So funny. Mm -hmm. I remember it being just sort of okay, but I just saw it recently with Murphy and I thought, damn, that was really good. It was a really good tongue in cheek genre horror film. Right. It was was a great, beautifully shot. And it wasn't bad at all. I thought it was really, really good. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a movie. I don't think you know the idea of the movie. I don't think it could be done today unless it was done for another independent production. I don't think a studio would go for it. You know, but it wasn't independent, and it and it was a low budget independent. I mean, Mm -hmm. it had big names in it, but it was low budget. Right. I mean, I think we all just wanted to go to New Zealand. Yeah. And, and it's Billy Boy Condon. It, you know, it was Michael Laughlin, who's the director, but Billy Boy Condon became Billy Condon. Right. You know, he directed Chicago. I mean, this guy became a big, 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 big deal. Yeah, and you worked... at the Academy Awards, Billy Boy. Yeah. He was the, the writer of that, and he was a kid at the time. Yeah, you worked with him a couple more times on uh, Strange Invaders and uh, Mesmerized. Is, is he still alive, even? Yeah. I believe, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 he is. You know, what's really scary is I am now old enough that when someone asks me that question, I go, I don't know, because oh, I do know people that die. That's really scary. Uh, no, Laughlin, I believe is, he is still alive. Yeah, I just don't know if he's directed in quite a time, a uh, long time. He's produced. He's continued to produce films, but also he's had a, a lot of side gigs. He was, uh, uh, yeah, he was an independent gentleman of means. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. D- 
Faye Young, I had a huge crush on her when I was a kid, and I'm trying to get an interview with her and stuff. She's super busy because she does sculpt, sculpting and artwork now. Really? Yeah. I had a crush on Faye Young, too. Who wouldn't? Oh, yeah. A couple guys I've interviewed told me, like, um, like every time, every time, uh, like, when they would work with her on a set, like, every, every guy on the crew would have a crush on her. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, no. She is, what's the word? I think the word is she was. I'm assuming she still is. Uh, creamy. But also, she was one of the guys. And that's the sexiest thing about a beautiful woman. Mm-hmm. Is when not only do they get the jokes, but they can make the jokes. Oh, yeah. You know, so um, she got the jokes, made the jokes, and was never offended about being silly about silliness. I love that in a woman. She could be one of the guys, and that that makes her twice as sexy. Yes, I agree. That's what I love in a woman. Yeah. And then uh, came the cult classic. One of the roles you're known for the most is Tron. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. Yes, it was it was a disaster at the time, but now it's iconic. Yeah. One of the most expensive movies ever to be made. Right. It didn't lose more money even at the beginning. It never lost money. Mm -hmm. Um, That I know about. It just didn't do the Star Wars money. Yeah. You know, and they were investing Star Wars money to make Star Wars money, and they broke even. That's what I believe. I mean, but I also know that they made a Tron exhibit at uh, Disneyland that probably wasn't that popular. But um, I don't know. Yeah, how, how did it, how, was it just a simple audition? It was, no, I, no. Uh, we had done a play. I produced a play in L.A. Mm-hmm. called The Sport of My Mad Mother. And I was in that with Peter Jurisic. I was a producer of it and put my buddy Peter Jurisic in it. Yeah. We were both in that. Um, and we were playing Fat and Cone. Mm-hmm. That was the name of our characters. And we were punk rock music, punk rockers. <laughs> um, and right after that, we got an audition together. There was a fellow, a friend of Peter's, who saw Sport of My Mad Mother, and within a week, we were both auditioning for Tron, and both got it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean, the theater used to mean something. Yeah. For film, and it still does in New York. It just doesn't necessarily mean as much in L.A., um, but it does mean something in New York, especially when you're young. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we both had careers. I heard it took like three months for principal photography and then like a year of post-production for all that amazing computer animation. Yeah, I believe it was more than a year and thousands of animators. Mm-hmm. I, was, I just remember just going to the first screen and then watching the credits go on and on and on and then have all of these Asian names that, you know, you couldn't read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I came out the summer before I was born. My my pa- my, <laughs> my parents took my brother to see it, and yeah. when they came out of the theater, they felt like they had been on an acid trip, you know? Right, and that's what it was when I read it. I said, well, this feels like an acid trip. Um, well, and then you meet Steven Lisberg, and you go, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Is he Is he, like, just really eccentric and stuff? Yeah. I mean, this world of proud nerds was, was given birth by people like Steven Lisberger. You know, when I grew up, nerds were sat in the back of the room and we called them nerds. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't necessarily nice. Now we call them nerds and they go, damn right, I'm a nerd. Yep. And because you have taken over the world, it's your world. <laughs> it's like, man, it's Lisberger's world and we're just living in it. Yeah. Um, and before he was the eccentric, he was the outsider, the, the kid in the back of the room. Now he's the kid who owns the room. Yeah. I know. And we're all happy to play in it when he lets us. And, um, and, and, and I just love that, that that's a real, uh, a real turn from my generation to your generation. And it's kind of, uh, I, I, as an observer, 
<laughs> I find it fascinating because I get to play nerds because I look like one. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I'm not necessarily, I don't have that kind of, that, 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 that brain thing. I just don't have it. Yeah, I'm, I'm street smart, but I'm not book smart, but I do know a lot about movies and pop culture and stuff, and I'm blessed but with you that. also know it from the inside. Exactly. You know what I mean? That pop yeah. culture wisdom comes from, um, yeah, it's, it's knowing who makes the art and what, how the art touches you. Mm-hmm, exactly. You know? Yeah. What, what was uh, Jeff Bridges like? Jeff Bridges is exactly as you would think he is. Mm-hmm. Right. And every time, watch Jeff Bridges' movies. This is what I love to say, but watch his movies and see how good the other people are. Mm -hmm. Every movie Jeff Bridges is in, the guy playing opposite him is brilliant. Yep. I mean, that's, that is amazing. Yeah, he's... Not only is he a great guy, but he is a great artist who elevates the people around him. And uh, I say that romantically and poetically, but it's true. Yeah, he's one of the greats. You know, there's no, there's no other way of putting it. I mean, just everything he does, he's just great in it. He is, but he's not always flashy because the characters aren't always flashy. Right. Sometimes he plays the guy next door. Sometimes he plays the most brilliant person in the world. Sometimes, you know, and he's just able to do that. And, um, but more importantly, he makes everyone around him better. He brings a level of truth to his work that. Uh, allows other people to bring a level of truth that they don't usually bring. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I just love watching him. I just love watching him. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I wish I could work with him more. You know, I worked with his dad and I worked with his brother. Mm-hmm. And what a family. I mean, I, I did, uh, uh, I did uh, The Blue and the Gray with uh, Lloyd Bridges, with his dad. Mm-hmm. And Bo showed up on the set in Arkansas. Wow. I shot, um, uh, uh, oh God, what was it called? A movie, a movie about Elvis Presley, about Elvis. Oh, yeah, um, the, the, was it The Colonel and, and, and Elvis yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah, Elvis and, Tur- and the Colonel. And Bo Bridges was the Colonel, and I played his best friend, his mm-hmm. sidekick, his producer. And um, Bo and Jeff showed up for that. They all show up on each other's sets. These was, they were a family of bricklayers who would show up on their other family's work sites Mm -hmm. to support them. But they weren't, because they were all artists, but they were also workers. Yeah. So they have this long history of Hollywood, but it's not just based on the fact that they look amazing and that they're really talented at what they do, but that it is a gig, and, you know, it's a job, and they all support each other. It was really something to watch. And, uh, you know, I was in their family so many times, it's three, <laughs> yeah. I always felt I was one of them. Um, and the amazing thing is that I can talk to Jeff, I'll call Jeff once every 10 years, yeah. and it's as if it was, a, he feels about me the same way I feel about him. Yeah. You know what I mean? He is Dan, just like I'm Jeff. Yeah. But the only difference is I watch him in movies all through the years, and he doesn't watch me. <laughs> I'm not there in force the way he is, but yeah. I'm still in his heart the same way he's in my heart. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's who he is. That's who he is. That, that's um, great. That's great camaraderie. Yeah. That's really good. I've had uh, Cindy Morgan on the show. She is such a sweet lady and a true feminist if ever there was one. Well, I'd love to say that in Tron, you know, all those people that painted us in, uh-huh. they made her look really good. Yeah. I agree. Maybe the sexiest human being that ever lived. Um, yeah, end of story. <laughs> Did you see the sequel? No. It's the same thing. I didn't see the Tron sequel, and I didn't see the Bill and Ted sequels. Um, I don't care. Uh, no, but I did do, uh, after the sequel, I had a thingy on the internet, on uh, in, on the box set, another scene. I shot a scene with Jeff, with Bruce Boxley. Mm-hmm. Saying there's not. 
Well, I, I personally didn't see the second one. I just had no desire to. I could just see from the previews that it's just, you know, digital garbage, you know. Yeah, yeah. All I know is that this is the way I like to describe it. Mm-hmm. I'm happy that my ex-wife is sleeping with someone else. <laughs> I don't want to see it. <laughs> it's exactly like that. Exactly. It's exactly like that. Because we, we fall in love with these films we make. Um, everyone does. Not everyone, but whoever, you know, certainly the actors and the director and the editors. Uh, whoever works on these films and gives their heart to them, they feel it's their child or, and or their lover. They make love in that. It's real. And then if you're not in the sequel or um, you're off the series, mm-hmm. you know, something happens. You know, I was on Cagney and Lacey and they killed me. Yeah. I couldn't watch ever again. Not that I wasn't happy for them, but I couldn't watch my love continually to make love with other people. It's too weird, too weird, too uncomfortable. Yeah. But that doesn't mean, you know, I'm happy they, that Bruce got to do Tron and Jeff and, you know, and I'm glad they all got to do that stuff. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of uh, Cagney and Lacey. Um, that, must, that must have been great. You got to have a steady paycheck until they decided oh, to yes. kill you off. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I wish they didn't kill me. <laughs> At the time, I didn't, I, I, it hurt like hell, but I, my career was still going strong. So Ad, Bill and Ted came after that. Right. You know, I had a really good career for another five years, um, but then it drifted off. Right. That's when I wish I had five more years of money, because then I wouldn't have to worry again. Um, but that didn't happen. Yeah, I heard. I heard they they shot that show in like a condemned building or something. Oh, Jack and Lacey. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. They rebuilt a, an old building in downtown LA and turned it into a squad building. It was a, a junk building. It's true. And they created this whole, the, the entire set was built. It looks like New York. Right now we have these studios in Brooklyn. Yeah. It looks a lot like the Cagney and Lacey building. Wow. And they built sets inside of these, these con- condemned old buildings. Yeah. Wow. And they were great to work with? The girls? Oh, yeah. Cagney and Lacey? Oh, Jesus, yeah. Man. It's so interesting because I, I, I just, what did I shoot? I shot... Um, TV show here in New York. <laughs> and, and um, Tom Selleck, what's it called? Blue Bloods? Blue Bloods. And Blue Bloods was produced by an old Cagney and Lacey producer. Yeah. And the it set on Blue Bloods, you show up on Blue Bloods, mm-hmm. the director comes and shakes your hand. The actors come in and say, thanks for coming. It's great to have you. Right. It's exactly what we did on Cagney and Lacey. Anybody who came on to Cagney and Lacey walked on that set. Because time came from the theater, and Sharon came from television, but hardcore television, old school, old right. school. And um, everybody was welcomed with open arms and treated like kings. Um, and that's not always the case. Um, and I find it really odd when that doesn't happen. But on the Cagney and Lacey set, man, everybody was treated like kings. Because we wanted to play at a high level. They were playing at a very high level. Tiny Channel were playing hardball. Yeah. did amazing work. These women were so good. Yeah, and I, I find it funny, too, that uh, Sharon Gless ended up marrying Barney Rosenzweig after they, like, fought every day on that show. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy that they did, because Barney's brilliant, mind you. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that was a brilliant show. It wasn't okay. It was, there was something, they were tackling, making big issues small, making them human. Um, and they do a little of that on Blue Bloods, but it's no comparison. None whatsoever. It's not even close okay. to the level of depth that they're approaching on Cagney and Lyson. They're trying to make it a family affair on Blue Bloods, but it's not anywhere near the family affair they created on Cagney and Lyson. I don't, I, I think it has something to do with the time, and uh, that's just it. Yeah, I can't be duplicated in this day and age. Yeah, maybe you could, but it hasn't been. And now the role you'll probably always be known as, at least, is Billy the Kid in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yeah, yeah. And how did that role come to you? That was just a 
regular audition. And I walked in the room and said, I'm better than a kid. And they said, you are. <laughs> and I said, thank you. Just that? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't know it was going to be good. It was one of these things that it was a throwaway. It was a silly job. I didn't know it was going to be that fun. Yeah. And, but we didn't know. How would we know that? And we didn't know. We knew it when, when Keanu and Alex were so delightful. Yeah. That's when we knew it. But we didn't know it would be that big. We didn't know that it would last for 40 years or however, 30 years. Um, and, yeah, people know it. I mean, they all know Bill and Ted's an adventure. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. I love, I, I, I love the part where, where all you historical figures are causing trouble at the mall. And yeah. I, I love how you and Socrates slip on the ice rink and you both got like five cops covering you. <laughs> yeah, it was really fun, really stupid, and really fun. You know, we all knew we were doing something really, how stupid can you be? How silly can you be? Mm -hmm. It was really fun. And um, yeah, yeah. Alex Winter, he was coming off of uh, The Lost Boys and Keanu was coming off of River's Edge. But... They were two. They were two really delightful guys to work with. They weren't. They didn't have like the young, you know, cocky ego actor thing going on. No, nothing that I had. <laughs> I, I'm sure I had that when I was younger. When I was, a, you know, I was ten years older than these guys, and I think when I was young, I had more of a cocky thing than either of them. Um, but they were. They were, look, they were wonderful. I. I it, they were. They. They were just having so much fun. Yeah. And and they had such an incredible rapport. And it was all about their rapport. The whole movie changes on their rapport. Mm -hmm. And it's real. I mean, they were incredible. And, you know, the only thing that I had thought was I thought Alex would be the big star afterwards. Yeah. And it turns out it was Keanu. And I didn't know. I just didn't know. And now I know. You know, I didn't know that Keanu's power. I didn't know that, that there's something that, I mean, I love talking about chemistry and um, he's got something that, that that's undescribable. Mm -hmm. You know? Absolutely. Just, yeah, because he's absolutely real. He is exactly that. He is that cool. I mean, that nice a person. People fall in love with him. Not with his talent. Not because he's brilliant. Not because he's ridiculously handsome. He's not. Mm -hmm. But there's something about him that is just so appealing to people. And I couldn't define it. And, uh, you know, I want, whenever I see him, I just want to hug him. Yeah, I saw, I saw him in like 10 movies before, like, Speed took him off, you know. Yeah. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, he's, I like, Ted is on the A-list, you know. <laughs> Oh, uh, Point Break. Point Break. He's fucking awesome in that. Mm -hmm. He's done some great movies, and he's also done some really mediocre ones, but he's a cool guy, and uh, and he deserves everything he got. That's for damn sure. And he is authentically wonderful. Yep. And after you did that movie, you did this one movie. I It's always been kind of an enigma to me because it cost like $50 million and it like went right to video. It's called Solar Crisis. Oh, man, yeah. Shit, wow, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was Richard Serapian directing it. Japanese Money. Oh. And they were doing it. They had a, a Japanese star in it. And it was... I don't know, man. I don't know. I never saw it. No, I did see it. I did see it. We did have a screening of it. It was reshot. We shot it once, and then they brought us back in to reshoot mm -hmm. with another director. Um, a guy named, um, uh, Jesus, Harpo's son. Oh, uh, Harpo Marx's son? Yes. Oh, wow. Harpo Marx did a reshoot on it. Um, I mean, they had all of his Japanese money in Sony, I believe. Um, but I'm not sure. And they were trying to salvage it and I'm, I'm sure it ran in japan i'm sure of it because mm -hmm. that's where the star power can i know charlton heston was in it jack uh, palance and uh, we had some i remember having a lot of fun Here's, i mean i gotta 
say this, if there's anything about my career which has gone up, gone down, and disappeared, yeah. um, I never don't have fun. And because to me, there's nothing more fun in the world than creating a work of art with other people. Right. Um, nothing is more fun than that. And the best people in the world are doing it. And they are the most fun. I mean, that's the thing about these fan things. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not wrong. Because, yeah. you know, these are the best people in the world. And they are so cool and so fun and so bright and so delightful and are, have so much joy that when you go to these fan fests that I go to very rarely, but I go like, what's it, like once a year somewhere, they invite me. Right. Everybody's having that same joy that we have on the set. Because this is your set. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and and we have that much fun on the set. And if you see us at these conventions, we find each other's friends, we find our friends, and we are still that connected as we were when we were shooting the thing. Um, I love making movies, and I love making television shows, and I love making theater, and I, I still do it, just not as much as I used to. Oh, well, I hope some I hope somebody puts you in a movie soon because that would be great if they did. It would be great. Here's the funny thing: is I'm not retired, mm-hmm. and um, I just don't work as much as I should. That's all. And I did what did I, I, you know, I still work. I shot Jessica Jones about a month ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's still happening. It's just not the way it was, and I'm not complaining. Yeah, I'm fetching. That's <laughs> <laughs> a big difference. When I lived in LA, I was complaining. Now that I'm in New York, I'm kvetching. Yeah. Because it's done with a wink and a sense of humor, because there's just no two ways about it. It is what it is. And um, and life goes on in New York. We do things. We are still functioning and up and about and creating at all times. I'm in the process of writing a book. And, nice. Um, Great. We did a, a backers audition that was accepted at the York Theater in Off Broadway, and we'll be doing that uh, next year. And I mean, stuff keeps happening. That's that's great. R- real quick, um, do you have any memories from uh, Ghoulies Go to College? Just I didn't even know Ghoulies. I never saw Ghoulies. Mm-hmm. I've never seen Ghoulies Go to College. I got a phone call from my manager saying the guys from Ghoulies going to college want to hire you to shoot today. And I mm-hmm. said, great. I showed up on the set. They glued all of these um, Ghoulies onto me like puppets. And I strangled myself and flushed myself down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> was that bad? The director was so funny. We had so much fun. And I worked with that director, the, 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 the um, the cameraman again, twice. Yeah. Later on. But um, that's it. It was a one day gig. I just remember flushing myself down the toilet. And that's it. And I've never seen it. And I'm sure I did a lot of screaming for 12 hours. And But all the puppet work is all me. Mm-hmm. It's just me wrestling myself. It was so ridiculous. <laughs> I think it's really very funny. Yeah, last week I interviewed a girl. She played like a uh, a party girl in the movie. She, yeah. she she didn't really have any memories of it either, other than she liked working with John Carl Beekler, the director. She thought he was Beekler, yes. She thought he was a nice guy and a, and a real genius. Yeah. yeah, he is a nice guy, really nice guy, and I remember having a hell of a lot of fun. Um, and I worked with him again. Mm-hmm. Probably he's done everything in in direct in and I movies. Think he worked on Doppelganger. Yeah. And I believe he worked with me. I worked on a thing. Shit. Anyway, I'm not sure. <laughs> so you do okay. So but so between doing all that stuff, is there anything else you do besides acting? Uh, I am a well. Look, I've had a job in New York City for the past four years mm-hmm. as a tour guide. I've been a bicycle tour. Oh. In New York. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, it's a funny thing. You know, you, what was it? It was just outed. They outed a wonderful actor in yeah. New York for, uh, for bagging Trader Joe's groceries. 
Jeffrey Owens. Yeah, and I yeah. you motherfuckers. Yeah. And I hope someone outs me for being a tour guide because I want a fucking acting career. Yeah. Literally, Jeffrey Owens is now working today because he's never stopped working as an actor in New York, mm -hmm. in the East Coast, when actors are not busy. Yep. It, it's a rare thing. Yeah. You don't make the money you make in L.A., uh, as a rule, if even if you know, I've done. I do one play a year, and I make between six and six hundred and a thousand dollars a week for three months. That's what I make. Okay, we're not rich here. We have to work. Right. So um, I work as a tour guide, and I have a fucking blast. Nobody knows that I have an acting career. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they ask if anybody asks, I say, "What do you do besides being a tour guide?" I say, "Oh, I'm an actor." They say, "What have been?" And I say, "Bill and Ted." They go, "Whoa!" You know, they get their minds blown. And they yeah. never expect that. But I have so much fun telling people about the city that I live in. I have a great time, and they have a great time. And the funny thing about New York is that the more you do doing something like that, the more your uh, muscles are involved, and the more your performance skills evolve. You know, I'm in yeah. constant performance. You know, I put on a show every day, almost every day. And... Um, yeah, I do that, but I also have a video production company, and I shoot uh, corporate videos online at least uh, two, three times a year. Mm -hmm. And what you didn't know is that I ran away from the world about 10 years ago. No, it's actually been 20 years ago. Oh, really? No, no shit, it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I left L.A. and moved to Saipan of the Northern Mariana Islands near Guam. Wow. I ran away. My career had reached a nadir, and I was teaching acting, but I was losing money every month, and I was, I was actually about $50,000 in debt. Wow. Um, and was losing my mind. Uh, I rented out my house in L.A., moved to Saipan of the Northern Mariana Islands, and became a video director, and directed for the video channels of Saipan, Guam, Kenyan, and Rhoda, and created travel videos for over two years. Mm -hmm. And then I created my own TV show there using local people and my students as my crew. Um, and I was a video person. And then I went off to uh, the Philippines and was a uh, working in the fashion industry, working for fashion television, directing uh, videos. Also hosted a reality television show in the Philippines. Wow. Aired in the Philippines and China for three seasons. Wow. Before I came back to New York to take care of my dying parents. And that was about 10 years ago. And uh, when I came back to New York, I've been doing theater again and episodes of TV shows and uh, still doing corporate video. They, the uh, travel videos did let the corporate video in New York, the corporate web stream videos. Um, so I am busy all the time. I do, uh, uh, you know, I do a tour guiding and then I'll take two weeks off, direct a video, and then I go back to the tour guiding. I'll take three months off, do a play, go back to the tour guiding to keep my muscles moving and to keep my wife from complaining about me not working. Wow. That is, that is amazing. Uh, wow. That, that is quite a journey, I have to say. Yeah. Absolutely. This is what you want to be doing. It's also what I want to be doing. If nothing has changed. Right. Nothing has changed. We're going to find a way to do it, whether it's for $100,000, $100 million, or $10,000, or $100. Yeah. Or nothing. Because yep. it's what we do. It's what our, our belief system is. It's what our purpose on life is, is to give people... Uh, a better understanding of what it is to be human. That's our gig. Um, and however we do that, you know, whatever medium we use, we're going to use that medium. But it is a part of the communications world. That's what we're in for. Um, my One of my biggest problems is, is that, you know, I'm on a tour guide, right? Mm -hmm. Tour guide. And people always ask me about politics because we're in New York right now. Yeah. We, we gave birth to this monster. Um, yep. Yes, Donald Trump is a monster. Yep, he sure is. But, <laughs> <laughs> I have to explain to all of these Europeans how this happened. Yep. What it is. And it's our purpose, the rest of us who are in the communication industry, to debunk the bad guys. Here's what we keep forgetting is that there actually are bad guys here. 
Mm-hmm. There's some really, really bad guys. And nobody talks about them. They talk about Donald Trump, who's just a lunatic and a bad guy. But um, our voices have to be louder than theirs, Fox News. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to be louder than them. We have to be as constant as them. We have to be as vigilant as them. The amount of time and energy they spend on misinformation and lying is we have to spend twice as much time on telling the truth about what it is to be human. And I know that the science fiction community is big in that. Yeah. Big on that. It's the biggest storyline of all science fiction. Yeah. Is that we are all in this together. You know? Yep. <laughs> That's it. It's always that. It's all about inclusion. It's all about the, the outsider become, being part of the team. It's always about that. And this movement, this uh, Fox News movement, is about us and them. And the us isn't even real. There's a fake us. They're not even real. Yeah, it's a rat race. It's a fake rat race. It doesn't even exist. Mm-hmm. You know, when they start screaming about um, outsiders, there's no such thing as an outsider, especially if you're from New York. Yeah. We're all in New York City. We are 100% immigrants. And the guy standing next to you is from somewhere else. It's yep. on every, every single elevator. You have a black guy, a white guy, a Latin guy, and an Asian guy. On every elevator trip. Yep. You know, there's no difference. Well, there is a difference. But not one is not better than the other. That nope. Fact, we're all completely different, but we're not better than the other. And the fact that they're selling that one kind of person is better than everybody else is a disgusting lie. Yep. And it is there for economic reasons and economic reasons only. And the only people that lose is everybody. Yeah, it's a small 5% population that Fox News is selling the world to, giving it away to, while they're destroying the planet by denying climate change. The worst people that ever lived. And that's, you know, that is the biggest mission right now that all of us have to uh, deal with. Is the fact is that there are bad guys and they are the enemy. Um, they've declared themselves the enemy. Um, they behave like the enemy. They're uninclusive. They lie and they cheat. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And this, I believe, and uh, it's... I mean, I know in the entertainment industry, so many people try to be quiet because they don't want to um, isolate potential employers and or fan base. But I don't care. I don't care. Right now, war has been declared. It was declared about 16 years ago. Yep. It, it was declared when Fox News took power. And uh, and that's, that's it. And the fact that we're not going after them with all our guns is just... Uh, Beside me, it's only the comedians. Yeah, we uh, yeah, it's our job. I mean, we you know we're being censored in every direction and everything, but you know it's only t it's only temporary though. I mean, yeah, I'm not worried about that. I mean, we are not going to be censored. They're not in America. Trying, yeah, Trump is trying, but um, oh, we got to shut them down. We got to shut them down. I don't know how. Anyway, I think it's getting. Yeah, I think it's getting there though. I really do. Yeah. So, do you? So do you? Uh, do you have any uh, conventions uh, coming up? No. The last few conventions that I went to, I didn't make much money. Mm -hmm. They tend to invite people that make money. So, I'd be back at conventions the second I make another movie. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I get to meet you at a convention and yeah. you've, you've had that. Uh, Where are you located? At the moment I'm in Redding, California. I'm originally from San Francisco. Yeah. 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 I have a good friend who lived in Redding, grew up in Redding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But 
but uh, yeah, I mean, I hope I get to meet you at a convention um, when you make a, another movie. And yeah, you've had an amazing life and career. And I thank you so much for your time, Dan. Yeah, I'm sorry for the sidetrack, but it's yeah, okay. I it. No, I love guests who are forthcoming and they can go off topic and talk about their beliefs and your passions. Uh, I, so yeah. I really appreciate it. Take care, Dan. Bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Dan Shore. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Dan. You're a really nice guy, an incredible journeyman of an actor, and passionate about your craft and the world issues and all that stuff. And it was an honor to interview you. Thank you so much, sir. Well, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>